So if you really want to optimize a factor portfolio, so first thing is that you have to research those factors, figure out those factors. There are multiple ways of finding factors. Uh, this is not the way we know for, uh, for a talk about how to find and how to develop factors. But once you have done it, then it's a very similar uh, optimization problem again. So you'll see that we had a expression very similar before. Uh, the first term here in the, in the first line, what you are trying to maximize. The first term is uh, return multiplied by the weights, and that is basically the, the rewards that you're getting. And the second line is the, uh, the variance, which is the risk that you are, the cost of return, the cost of rewards. And in the cost of rewards, you'll see that we just had a sigma before. Now we have an expanded expression there. And uh, that is because we have a source of covariance matrix from the factors. And also, uh, whatever is not explained by the factors, that is the residuals. Uh, and uh, we have a variance matrix from those residuals as well. So, and necessarily we have a different lambda as well for that, the, the sensitivity to each of these factors that you want to optimize. So one is the factor uh, lambda, one is the asset lambda. So again, we, we can just uh, normalize, uh, optimize this expression and uh, come up with the factor allocation. So it's uh, not very significantly different. So do you think, are there any other optimization methods that apart from mean variance that can be used? So mean variance is a very, very useful method for uh, for uh, developing a portfolio. Uh, so even if your underlying assumptions are not correct, they're more often than not uh, closer to the perfect solution. So we should never underestimate a mean variance optimization. At the same time, as I've seen before, that average portfolio is also not something to be underestimated. Uh, because if you are very, very skeptical about our models, that is what we should do. But uh, there are other situations as well where you can do uh, something different. So for example, KD optimizations or risk parity optimizations. So if you talk about the KD, uh, so the expression that you're trying to uh, use for uh, the U, the utility function is slightly different. So it's a log expression, ln stands for logarithm to natural base. Um, so it, it, it looks complicated, but it's really not. What it's trying to do is that uh, it's trying to optimize or maximize your terminal wealth. So each, so for a multi-period, for each period you are accumulating wealth, one plus R1 into one plus R2 into one plus R3 and so on. So then uh, you are uh, taking, uh, you are trying to maximize this. So instead of maximizing this complicated uh, expression, you're taking log so that it becomes easier. Uh, so it kind of become a log utility function. And then you're trying to to maximize this expression. So, so it's mathematically great. Uh, uh, in fact, it, it comes under the family of things that we call constant relative risk aversion. We are not going to get into that. Uh, in case you're interested, you can ask me later. Uh, so what about the practicality of this? So we see that uh, from both theoretically and from practice, we see that the Kelly portfolio uh, in the long run, it dominates all other strategies in in the terms of the final wealth because of, of uh, because of course it's focused on maximizing final wealth and also the time achieved to that so fastest and the highest which is which sounds very good but of course uh, if you're familiar with finance you know that there's no free lunch uh, so it comes at a cost. The cost is that it's most aggressive in terms of risk. So the risk parameter, the risk averseness is most aggressive. That is the lowest. So uh, among similar class of uh, utility models. Uh, so here, what you do is that you run a higher risk of ruin in the short run, in the short term, uh, with the promise of being the best in the long run. So it is basically, so if you think about it, if you are a very young and just started investing, and you can lose, a, you can take a hit essentially. So Kelly is not a very bad thing for you, but uh, are you going to suggest Kelly for a retiree? Probably no, that will be probably not what she, uh, she needs. There are other optimization things like uh, the risk parity that you have talked about. So risk parity is a very different beast. So here we are talking about uh, 
equating what you call the individual risk contribution. So the expression is above. It's uh, something like you are taking the sensitivity of uh, the risk with respect to a particular asset I, we, the, the derivatives part of it, uh, and then uh, we are just uh, weighing with the particular asset allocation in that asset I, and we're saying that this is my individual risk contribution. If you see that all this sums up to the portfolio risk, uh, it can be proven mathematically, so you can just take my word for it. And what you're demanding is that the sigma I for all I, for all assets should be equal. So this is disparity. There is no theoretical justification here. So it's just uh, something that people thought it makes sense that all your uh, stuff in your as uh, in your portfolio will have equal risk. Now, if you think that uh, if you think about it, the most important part is that it talks only about risk. So whether in MPT or whether in Kelly or whether in uh, any other things that I've seen, it's a basically balance between mean and variance. Means is essentially returns and variance is the risk. Here we are only talking about risk no no returns right so if the market is uh, efficient of course the risk should be uh, proportional to the returns but here we do not talk about explicitly about that so what the upside of that the upside is that uh, we are far more uh, we, we are far more better model to measure risk than returns so this kind of allocations become far far uh, superior in terms of its robustness uh, to model errors